It is really lovely to see you all here this morning as we start our service. Uh, if you're visiting, uh, welcome. If you're here for the first or the hundredth time, you're as welcome as ever. And we trust that you will feel very at home today in our presence. Uh, God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. So I want to read to you just a few verses from Isaiah. We normally start the service with um, a psalm, <clears throat> but these words in Isaiah are just beautiful. Um, and Isaiah 40 talks a, a lot about God uh, being an amazing God in so many different aspects. And verse 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart, and he will gently lead the mother sheep with her young. And uh, if you're coming weary and a little bit lonely this morning, know that God carries you close to his heart. Then over in verse 28, it says, Have you never heard, have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. 
No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall into exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles and they will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not grow faint. So this morning as we worship the Lord, come to him and rest in him. He will never grow weary. He will never forget you, friends. You can't exceed God's love or understanding. It's for you. Let's stand and sing the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. You are the word of the beginning, one with God through all time. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name. Powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a 
And because the name of Jesus means God saves, it means God is with us, we have the right to be called the sons and daughters of the King. What an honour. We are blessed and not cursed. And I often remind my customers when they come into the shop, you know, you are loved beyond measure. I don't know whether any other shopkeeper reminds their customers of that, but, you know, they just need to hear it. And often they say, I really needed to hear that. So this morning, friends, let those words sink in. This, this song is in a, a little bit of a funny key, so for those altos, you built this one out. But if, you have a, if you're a soprano like Elizabeth... She'll find somewhere to sing. You sing an octave higher, but just listen to the words. I am who you say I am. Don't let the world put you in a box. Don't let the world say you're, you're not good enough. You didn't do the right thing. Listen to God and he says you're chosen. You're my daughter, you're my son. Let's sing. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, Lord, his love for me, for his love.
together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you sent your son, your precious only son, to die for us, to die for the sins of the whole world. Father, you left no one out. You looked back through history. You looked down through history and you omitted no one. None of us were good enough, Lord, and yet you saw a way to make us right with you through the blood of Jesus. And so, Father, we are just so grateful this morning that his blood paid for all of our sins. And, Father, we thank you that we can come this morning and say to you, take our sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west and know that you will remember them no more. Father, thank you that you see us as sons and daughters. So, Lord, we just come to you this morning and say, Daddy, heal us, make us whole, cleanse us, make us new, restore us, give us energy, Lord, to do everything that you want us to do while we're here on earth. Comfort those who are grieving, Lord. And hold us in the palm of your hand that one day we will walk with you. And one day there will be no pain and there will be no suffering and there will be no evil. And there will be no sin because you conquered death. And so, Father, today we stand in the victory of an empty grave. And we believe that we are who you say we are. And we dedicate ourselves once again to you this morning and just pray that you will move in us, you will continue to work in us, you will live through us and we will be all that we can be in the name of Jesus. Amen.
comes to lead us. Housekeeping. We've always got housekeeping, haven't we? <coughs> Our service will be at the front and at the uh, rear of the church. So, um, uh, is that right? Yes, it is right. They'll be at the front and the rear. I suddenly thought. I thought, no, hang on. We're carrying carrying communion service up and down. I thought, no, we're not. So anyway, communion service front and back. Stay a safe distance. Uh, the folk that are not able to hop up uh, will serve you in your seats. Uh, That'll be great. Offering bowls are there as well. Manuals, instruction booklets, recipe books, etc. What do they all have in common? Recently, I, with others, had the privilege of putting together some well-boxed, flat-packed furniture for Russell and Leslie. <laughs> They're laughing at me. They didn't know we were going to say this. And you guessed it, from Ikea. Boxes were well-labeled. Each box had a booklet of assembly instructions, so detailed, so many pages for a simple piece of furniture. Screws, nails, locking tabs, timber, etc. slid from each box as they were opened and unpacked. Materials were well packed and it was obvious that the manufacturer had given much thought to the end product and how it was to be manufactured, packed, delivered, assembled, etc. We all like a great feed. How often do we see a recipe book on the kitchen bench top as something unusual is created that more than tempts our taste buds? Smell those beautiful ingredients wafting about the room as they simmer on the stove top. I am not sure what flavours attract each of you. However, there are many that catch me. And it is good old fashioned and it is the good old fashioned recipe book that always seems to create this, that special something. You can almost taste from the uh, photo up there, and I guess that's advertising. It is good to get out and about, and it's something I really enjoy. Always something to see and to do, to explore. In times past, you would pull out the UBD or the Refidex, the Millway or, or a road atlas, if not sure of the route or destination. Nowadays, it would probably be Google Maps or GPS or something. Either way, it would get you safely from A to B. Men like tinkering with things, often things mechanical. And it may be the car or the, the boat or the lawnmower. It could be anything. Always a toy to play with. And how much easier with a manual to call up uh, when repair or maintenance is needed. As I said earlier, manuals, instruction booklets, recipe books, etc. All good guides for the things we do and intended to make life easier. I did see the above. And, <laughs> and how so true when we launch into the unknown. <laughs> We're not so sure of where we are going. Can I say... Uh, I assemble some pieces of IKEA furniture for uh, Russell and Leslie twice. I think I almost did something three times, but we won't talk about that. Sometimes an hour-long task, that takes hours. Are you able to resonate with that? And I think I know the answer. I think I just heard the answer. With all of these thoughts in mind, I could not help but think that the greatest instruction book of all was God's Word the Holy Bible. Interesting, is it not, that the Lord God would want to uh, give us a book of instructions. In Deuteronomy 4, 35 and 36, uh, the Lord said, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. Out of heaven he let uh, you hear his voice, that he might instruct you on earth, he showed you his great fire and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire and 
I could, uh, instructions, I could read more, but we won't go further there. Instruct, instruction, instructions, instructed, etc. It's mentioned 83 times in the New King James Version. 26 of which are from the book of Proverbs. From Solomon, king of Israel, David's son, we read from chapter 1, verse 2, right at the beginning. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment and equity. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma. The words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. That seems to say it all. And you will find some real gems as you read through the first 24 chapters of Proverbs. Maybe that's a challenge for all of us. Jesus instructed us to remember him. And he saw his earthly time coming to an end. Jesus was having what he called the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. A Passover meal with his disciples. Where he spoke of things to come, particularly the immediate future. He knew his end was nigh and knew it was to be, a, to, to be a tough one. Matthew 26, 17 to 29 tells this story. We won't read that now, but yeah. Today we serve the Lord Jesus. And it is that same Lord Jesus that we remember, as mentioned in these verses. Jesus told his disciples, his followers, to remember him by taking the bread. His broken body and the cup, his shed blood, as often as we meet, we're meeting today. We do remember him through these simple elements. What a great opportunity that is for each of us. Those holding trays will take up their positions as we give thanks. And as said earlier, the uh, bread and the cup is available at both the front and at the rear. And uh, somebody will uh, come to you uh, if you're not able to uh, uh, jump up. Let's come before the Lord, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, uh, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are, almighty, Lord, all-knowing. And, uh, uh, Lord, you love us, Lord. Uh, boy, what more can we say? And, uh, Lord, we do remember you, Lord. And, uh, uh, Lord, we do that faithfully, Sunday by Sunday. And, uh, uh, do, Lord, we do it more often than that. But, Lord, we certainly uh, gather for, uh, uh, to take the bread and the cup, Lord, as we... Uh, as we remember what you've uh, suffered for us, Lord, and uh, Lord, you, you did that so willingly. So, uh, so Lord, be with us now, we pray. It, uh, uh, Lord, just uh, bless us, Lord, and uh, we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
It is such a joy to be here and uh, lovely to have um, Bob's family here with Elizabeth. Thank you. And lovely to see you too, Jerry. Lovely to see your brother. And it's lovely to have Anne back. Beautiful Anne. Are you feeling better? Praise God. Um, I'm not sure if, if Mark has any announcements or anything, no. So if you're having a birthday this week, we wish you a very, very happy birthday. Is anyone having a birthday this week? Don't be shy. <gasps> Del, Brian is. Happy birthday, Brian. No one else? Well, we hope you have a great day. Mark and I are actually jetting off um, yeah, we are. We're going overseas and it's not Bribie or Chambers Island. Um, because 30 years ago on the 2nd of March, we said, I do. And there were people in this church, lots of people in this church, who stood that day in our wedding service and said that they would pray for us and support us. And guys, you have. And I am just so grateful. And I know 30 years doesn't seem a lot to some of you guys because you've soldiered on and been a faithful witness for so many more years than that. But you know what? You've been an example to us and continue, please, to be an example uh, because that's what I had these really deep conversations with me of why are our young people doing the things that... It's really easy to say. You know, we've lost our moral comp compass. You know, we've given kids choice. And children don't have the means of life experience to make those choices. They need older people. They need parents and grandparents and extended community to show them the way. So thank you for being the way for Mark and I. We're going to a second honeymoon that I will tell you that my hubby planned as a surprise. <laughs> even staying where we stayed 30 years ago because he went home and found it in our photo album. <laughs> How cool is that? Anyway, back on to matters of God, although that's a matter of God. <laughs> I read this um, by David Jeremiah, during, no, by a Our Daily Bread during the week and I think it will resonate with you. It says, remember to sing, and Psalm 147.1 says, how good is it to sing praises to our God? Nancy Gustafson, a retired opera singer, was devastated when she visited her mum and observed her decline from dementia. Her mum no longer recognised or and barely spoke. After several monthly visits, Nancy had an idea and she started to sing to her. Her mother's eyes lit up at the musical sounds and she began singing too for 20 minutes. Then Nancy's mum laughed, joking that they were the Gustafson family singers. The dramatic turnaround suggested the power of music, as some therap therapists conclude, to evoke lost memories. Singing old favourites has also been shown to boost moods, reduce falls, lessen visits to the emergency room and decrease the need of sedative drugs. More research is underway on the music memory link. Yet as the Bible reveals, the joy that comes from singing is a gift from God and it's very real. How good is it to sing praises to our God? How pleasant and fitting to praise him. 
And this morning we're going to sing a couple of songs that I know will be ones that you will go, I was here when we sang this. I was there when I first sang that or heard that hymn. And uh, let this music stir your heart with a renewed love for our Heavenly Father.
And may this be our story and our song. Thanks, Barbie and team. One of the great kicks us speakers get sometimes is to sit in a service and 
just know that God's molding something together because as if you can remember the songs or the words we have sung, a lot of them fit straight into where God's taken me this morning. So that tells me, gives me a confirmation, an affirmation that he's got something special to say to us. And Barbie, thanks for that little story from the Daily Bread. Um, that was my case with my mum very much you know, when she the last stages of dementia when it seemed that she wasn't there um, i would go in and sit beside her and get the hymnal out and sing and her eyes would open and she would sing with me how did that happen every song and a little hand was going like this to make sure we kept in time i got no idea how that works how music just is of god surely it is of the spirit and, and how he can rejuvenate someone who seems to be gone to bring them back. Well, just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciated that. I got so much out of that. And therefore, those last two songs, I just had mum in my, in my mind. It was gorgeous. Um, yeah, um, listen, I've got... S- I've laboured over this this message and, and there's a reason for that. And because of that, um, I've decided, I've manuscript what I've, I'm going to say today. And the reason I've manuscript it is I wanted to make sure I could carefully construct the words um, for the things I'm going to express. Um, it's a good discipline and I certainly depend on it sometimes. And... Um, and so, I may say some things that you may never have heard before, and you may wish to reflect on that. And uh, um, so, if you would like a copy of these notes, which I'm going to stay fairly close to, um, we're, they're going to be made available to you. So, Ian, Ian Grieve down the back, he is very happy to photograph these if they're helpful to you. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we know that you have a message for each and every one of us, and this has been the case in the service so far. So we pray for your spirit to settle upon us. May you help us to open our ears, to hear the spirit speak to us as a church, to us as individuals. Amen. Um, Just recently, I finished reading a book from... Ravi Zacharias, I don't know if you, some of you guys know, he's a great, excellent author. He's gone with the be the Lord last year. But he would have had to have been one of the world's finest apologists. And, uh, and I think his best writings were the last writings where he looks back on his life and profoundly speaks very simply and with great depth. And uh, the name of the book that I read was called uh, Recapture the Wonder. Recapture the Wonder of Life, Recapture the Wonder of God. Great book. Highly recommend it. It's not that difficult to read. Within that book, there's a story that just captured me. And in, in a minute it captured me. It's one of those moments where you just got to stop and reflect before you go any further. And uh, it inspired this thought in me and it just started to roll out of that thinking and I was probably preoccupied for quite some time. And so this is where this message has come from. It's just one story which I'm going to tell you. Today's text, I'm going to be referring back to it probably most of the way through the message this morning, is Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 to 34 so Matthew chapter 6 if you've got your Bibles or your phones and you can follow that it would be really helpful because I'm going to be going back and forwards a little bit let me tell you the story <coughs> Ravi Zacharias talks about a bird called the red knot sniper a sand sniper does anybody know what the red knot sand sniper is anyone 
Well, I didn't know until I look at the until I read the book. Interesting little bird. Now, each year, this these birds migrate an amazing distance of eighteen thousand miles, not kilometres, miles each year. Okay, commencing on the southern tip of South America, and they fly back to the Arctic islands. Argentina, Brazil, north coast of South America, the Atlantic, and arrives at Delwa Bay marshlands near Philadelphia at the very same time when the horseshoe crabs are laying millions of eggs which the, these birds can gorge themselves upon. When plumply, well overfed, they make their way all the way through Canada and stop just north of Hudson Bay where they mate and breed. The female first leaves a nest when the chicks are almost ready to fly. The male leaves exactly one week later to return back that whole trip they've just been on. And they leave the chicks to fend for themselves for a month later. At that time, the matured chicks commence a 9,000 mile journey to Tierra de Fugo, in Argentina, knowing exactly where to stop along the way for rest and where available food is waiting for them. What an extraordinary story. These birds are not taught where to go to find food. They sim simply instinctively know. God has creatively designed these birds with instinct. As I contemplated that story of the red and not sand sniper, I thought of other creatures that also have obviously creative design instinct. Turtles. Salmon. Whales. How do they, how do they know to go back where they've come from and all the fine food? Too hard to understand. I then thought about our older dog, Nala when she gave birth to a litter of pups. Um, Nala instinctively knew that she needed to lick each pup clean and eat the birth sacs, which we now understand provides the essential properties required for a mother dog to produce a specific milk for the newborn pups that they needed. Nala was not taught that. She simply instinctively knew what to do. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? In fact, it would be correct to say that all creatures are creatively designed with an instinctive intelligence. Not only so, what about plants? Plants also have a creatively designed, or they're designed with an instinctive intelligence. As a point of interest, I was reading that Dr. Sarah Shallon from in 1960s of the Lewis L. Brewick National Medicine Research Center in Jerusalem, it's quite a mouthful, archeologically discovered some palm seeds found stored within the ancient Masada for a fortress in Israel. Believing to be approximately 2000 years old, and guess what happens when they put the seed in the ground? It germinated. Uh, for 2,000 years. That's amazing. I just had to share that. That's an incredible story. That, um, that the design that was in that seed could last that long. And that design grew. I think that's simply amazing. So when I read Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6... In verse 26 it says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Okay? I understand that God has... I'm better understanding these days that God is, has creatively designed birds and all creatures for that matter with in, an instinctive intelligence, his intelligence, so that they would be fed as needed. Can we agree on that? I think that's just a, to me, it's a foregone conclusion because it doesn't make any other sense, does it? 
And furthermore, when Jesus says in verse 28, see the flowers of the field, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. I understand that Jesus is clearly inferring that the design creation of a flower with instinctive intelligence has much greater value to God than anything we can possibly make for ourselves. And if that is how God values plants, how much more greater value then has God placed on humans and his desire to care for his prized creation? How much more? Us humans may consider ourselves as very clever indeed for what we are able to invent and create. But what separates human creativity ability different to God's creative ability is that God designs his creations with instinctive intelligence. To say it even more simply, God's creations includes life. Human creations do not. There's the defining difference. Even though we think we're very clever in what we can make, a flower has greater worth to God because of how it's designed with life than anything we can do. Isn't that extraordinary? A flower. All of God's creation, designed with instinctive intelligence, glorifies Almighty God, our amazing Creator. I found these scriptures in Colossians. <clears throat> For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. The Psalms. Let everything that breathes, what doesn't breathe? Take breath or take air away from it, everything dies, right? So that everything that breathes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's obvious. Job, he writes, I like this one. Ask the beasts. They will teach you. The birds of the heavens. And they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth. And they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all of these does not know the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the, is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Another psalm. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that's in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest Sing for joy. Another psalm. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. Then sing praises to your name. Isn't that incredible? The earth. All that's in it. Just being here just reeks about God and brings praise to our creator. So how amazing is God's creation? And what's even amazing, even much more, is God's prize creation, human beings. In our text, Jesus asks the question in verse 26, are you not more valuable than they? Or the birds, your creatures? If God cares for the birds in the manner in which he does, how much more does he want to care for his prized creation than the birds? And they all get fed. They all get looked after. He's built this instinctiveness in them to make sure it happens. And we're worth much more than that. Verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which are more valuable than anything else that humans can make, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire, will he not much 
more clothe you, which is to refer that the God wants to care for your needs. You can understand why Jesus said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God's got it in hand. Distinguishingly different to all of God's creations, God creates humankind in his image. Distinguishingly different. John chapter 4, 24 says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is spirit. And we have a spirit. It's not difficult for us to accept that it is our spirit that defines who we truly are for both Christian and those who are not Christian. For we all can agree that when a person dies, that person's spirit, their person, their personality has left their body. And hence the reason why a person's death is referred to as passed on, gone to be somewhere else, the spirit has gone. The person has gone. All that's left is a shell. Christian, non-Christian makes no difference. We all seem to accept that. That's a great starting point when talking to non-Christians. Solomon wrote, the dust, referring to our bodies, shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. God created our spirit. That's mind-blowing, that one. The body is a, is a home for a life. Ever thought about that? A body is a home for a life the Apostle Paul referred to human bodies as earthly tents or jars of clay. Temporary. But how amazing, though, are our bodies? Psalm 139 says that our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. And yes, indeed, creatively designed with instinctive intelligence. Now, my w recent work accident, which injured uh, my knee joint ligaments once again has reminded me how much I take the intricate works of my physical body for granted. We don't even know how our bodies operate. We simply expect that it will operate when we want it to operate. It's only when we get stopped that we realise how intricate our body actually is and how it works together. Listen to this. We do not speak to our bodies. However, and amazingly, our bodies actually speak to us. Let me explain. Our youngest son, Matthew, is an exercise physiologist. And he tells me that much of his work involves watching the reaction of the body movements to diagnose problems and to ascertain healing progresses watches and what he sees speaks to him and he tells me he tells Matthew what is going on my darling wife the midwife she tells me how she allows the physical reactions of her ladies to tell her how each woman is progressing during childbirth isn't that right darling she just after 30 plus years or whatever she's been doing midwifery, she can just watch and observe and the body speaks to her and tells her what's going on. Isn't that amazing? Childbirth in itself is just mind-blowing. Now, I have a very strong hunch that our good Dr Don down the back there would find it a simple task to provide for us a lecture. I mean, in fact, I think he'd enjoy doing this one on how the human body instinctively operates. Would you like to do a lecture on that sometimes? <laughs> I think I'm making the point there, aren't I? 
no matter if Christian or not, our most amazing bodies exclaim the glory of God. Just our bodies, just us. My goodness, don't we take things for granted. God has also designed our spirit, our person, with instinctive intelligence that not only distinguishes our unique personalities, but also reveals to us how God intends to use our uniquenesses for his ordained purposes. For example, okay, I identify myself with, um, with having an instinctive capability to en envision things. As many of you know, I have a keen ability to build things. Tools of many descriptions seem to be natural extensions of my hands. And I really can't tell you why that is so. Jack of all trades, master of none, as they would say. I just instinctively understand when a tool gets put into my hands. But behind my building ability lies a visionary capability that enables me to see the finished product of what I am building before I commence building. My visionary capability also enables me to clearly identify the processes involved within each building project before I commence the, the construction. In fact, if I cannot clearly envision a project and understand the construction processes, irrespective of the advice I may hear, I will not commence the project. That's just one of one of my instinctive abilities. What instinctive abilities do you have? Never thought about it? Abilities that you cannot explain. Why you have such abilities? A good question to ask is, have your vocations or professions followed on from your instinctive abilities? That's a good question. My wife, Jo, has an incredible instinctive ability that still amazes me. I can walk into the kitchen. She says, it's in the top um, drawer on the right-hand side. <laughs> Am I alone on that one? I, got, I, I reckon information's leaking because I can't say... I won't say nothing and she knows what I'm thinking. Anyway, leave that one alone, Mark. Okay. okay, it's also positively helpful to consciously identify what is not naturally instinctive to us so that we will rely upon others who are gifted differently to what we are and in doing so, other people feel valued and appreciated. Uh, this is the lesson within um, the Apostle Paul illustrates as the church being like a physical body. He says in, in Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, for that, not for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And it goes on. If you're not like this, doesn't mean you're not part of the body. Okay, so everyone has a part to play. Even though that we have this tendency to compare what other people are doing, wish we would be like them, the reality is we're not. So the, this illustration tells us that we learn, need to appreciate the differences that we have and what we bring to the table, so to speak. Now, the foot should... Oh, sorry. <laughs> but in fact, it says, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one, but one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. God has specifically... has a specific purpose in mind for each individual, which he has blessed with specific ability that no one else can do as well as that person can. For God's good 
and pleasing will. So yes, I, I encourage people to spend time with God and to consider how uniquely different you are created to be from everyone else and celebrate that. The last point I desire to share with you today is possibly the most important. And that is, God has creatively designed our spirits with an instinctive intelligence to experience meaning, purpose and contentment. A built-in, must-have, homing beacon of sorts, one could say, in relationship with him. But all went pear shape with the world's harmony when sin entered the world. Instead of finding meaning, purpose and contentment in and with God, mankind began choosing to find those things for themselves. My literacy friend Oswald Chambers writes, God created mankind to be the master of of the life in the earth and the sea and the sky. And the reason mankind is not is because mankind took the law into their own hands and became master of themselves, but of nothing else. That's fairly profound. Okay, let's go back to our text. In verse 31 it says... Jesus is saying, do not worry, saying what we should eat, what we shall drink, or what we shall wear. I do go back to the message version times. It really picks up on the context of what's been said. And it says, Jesus says, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. Verse 32, it says, For pagans, that is, people who are without God, for pagans run after all these things. That's what people who worry about all that stuff are the, is what expected from people who are not following God. Ecclesiastes says that there is nothing better for a person under the sun, and he's referring to people without God. There is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. That's all anyone without God can hope for in attempting to fill the void of true meaning, purpose, and contentment. That's all they can hope for. Eat, drink, and be merry. In, an, in a, trying to find these things that they desperately want, the things that God has put into our spirits like a homing beacon, as I mentioned, we must have. Solomon goes on to say that any attempts to find trueness or, or meaning and purpose and contentment without God is meaningless a chasing after the wind. Do you remember Pastor Steve? He used that illustration. If you can imagine someone running around with a butterfly net trying to catch the wind, how absurd. And that's probably gives that very, very, very good context. Chasing after the wind, you can't catch it. Verse 33, Jesus says, But seek first God's kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. The message version says it so well. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. The only way forward is God's way. Because God so loved his prized creation and desires for them to be re-engaged with true meaning, purpose and contentment in relationship with himself, God gave us Jesus. That whoever believes in him would find true life with himself, with God for eternity. 
Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and to have it to the full. Full with true meaning, purpose and contentment. Breaking the power of sin and death on the cross and by his resurrection, providing atonement and redemption for all mankind, Jesus has provided the way forward for whoever to enter into God's kingdom. For anyone who would believe in Jesus and accept God's gift of salvation provided by and through Jesus. God's built-in must have homing beacon within our spirits God's creatively designed instinctive intelligence is beckoning his prized creation to reconnect with himself with God that beacon is pulling us each and every one it's just that unfortunately a majority of of the population that we live within do not understand it is God who is beckoning him them to them to himself this great hunger great thirst deep in our souls that wants to find true meaning and purpose contentment that beacon is God's instinctive intelligence pulling us to have it. John chapter 1 and 5 says, The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. We've got this beacon. Every person has this beacon built into them instinctively. And I think when we're talking to our friends who are not of the Lord, Remain mindful of that. They don't understand it because they're in the dark. The darkness has not understood it. But we do. For those who have heard the call and have accepted God's gracious gift of salvation, salvation is just the beginning of God's transformation for our lives with Christ. As Jesus promises... He sends to us the Holy Spirit to continue to refine us to become all God would have us become, which is called the process of sanctification. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we we see the words, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who have unveiled faces, which is to mean we can see the light in the darkness, contemplate, the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Sanctification is something that the Holy Spirit does within our spirits. Something It is something that we cannot do for ourselves. And as we continue to surrender ourselves to God, God's Holy Spirit will continue to refine us to be more like Jesus until earthly death brings us totally into the presence of God. As God has a timely, had timely brings things into place at times, I was reading my my early morning devotion this morning and I read these words and once again it just confirmed me that this is what God wants us to hear so I'm going to finish the message today with these words concern over our personal holiness causes us to focus our eyes on ourselves And when we become overly concerned about the way we walk and talk and look out of fear of offending God, and he adds in, but perfect love casts out all fear, once we surrender to God, 
to surrender to God is of more value than personal holiness. To surrender to God is of more value than of personal holiness. Let's pray. Almighty God, just, you are just um, more than we could possibly comprehend. And the value that you've put on us, human beings, compared to all other creation, is just astounding. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge our differences. We acknowledge our uniquenesses that you've created us to be to bring about your work the way you would have us do. Open our eyes, Lord, to this truth. Help us to understand this instinctive intelligence that you've put in us to help us identify that and your leading spirit that will continue to refine us to be the people you would have us be. You are truly an amazing God the great creator we humbly bow we lift our eyes to you because you are our breath you give us life you give us meaning and purpose and contentment and you give us hope so we thank you lord thank you for touching us this morning help us because we know that Dealing with ourselves is the most difficult thing we'll have to do here on earth. But have your way. Make us as you wish us to be. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks, Mark. Amazing, profound truths there in those words. And it kind of fits with uh, the last song we're going to sing. You know, so often we, we want to run our race and we want to do our own thing. Um, and we want to give it our best shot because we're Aussies and that's what Aussies do. But this song reminds us that our battle is not our own. The battle belongs to the Lord and and just as Mark said, he just wants our surrender. So this morning, let's give it over to him. Let's acknowledge that he is our almighty fortress, that nothing can stand against the power of our God. Do you believe that this morning, friends? Oh, a couple of you do. (laughs) Let's stand and sing and... uh, Just sing this song of victory. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a As I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? There's nothing impossible for you. When all I 
see all the ashes, you see the beauty. Praise God. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. He's alive. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Tell God this morning. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I'll lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Give it to him. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Father God, the battle belongs to you. We hand it to you now, Lord. We can't do it on our own. So we surrender to you, Father, where there are obstacles in the way, where there is something blocking our path. Father, we surrender it to you. And Holy God, just fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Let his power move through us. Let it energize us. Let it guide us and direct our path so that we can be beacons for you, that we can be the salt and the light our world so desperately needs to hear and see. Father, we just thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for all those who are here this morning. We pray that you would suit a blessing to every household represented and that you would go before us, that you would hem us in and that you would remind us that you will never leave us and never forsake us. Father, we pray this morning for those who aren't here and we pray, Lord, a blessing on uh, Steve and Jenny as they take this time of refreshment and um, holiday. Lord, just be with them and guide them and uh, bless them. Father, thank you for the words that have been spoken this morning. Thank you for all those who have participated. Thank you for being with us always in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle be 